Would you guys give a welcome to Russ Miller as he comes to share God's word with us? Oh, how are you doing this evening? Great. I was, I'm going to assume most of you were probably here this morning, but not everybody. So I'm going to cover just a couple things uh, a second time, maybe a little bit quicker. But let's go ahead and get right into this message. Uh, this actually, I want to talk about Darwinian evolutionism in this first session. Uh, the Bible says in Romans, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And as I said this morning, you know, it doesn't mean a person is stupid. I know brilliant people that have been fooled into believing in Darwinian evolution. And the Bible says, and they've changed the glory of the uncorruptible God, which I think today is his creation, into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. It sounds to me like they're going to change creation into the fairy tale of Darwinian evolution, which lets you think you're the most evolved, you're your own God. We call that humanism today. These verses, again, are talking about idolatry, and the highest form of idolatry is to think you are your own God. You're the most evolved. You know, one of Satan's top lies is that evolution is science. If you talk to a college student who's in science, and you start attacking and undermining Darwinian evolution, they will accuse you of attacking science. And if you point out, no, I'm not attacking science, I'm attacking evolution, they will say evolution is science. And they have actually been taught this. They, they confuse evolution with science. Here's an email I got. You make Christians look stupid when you attack science. I never attack science. Real science is a believer's best friend. Always has been always will be. And then they go on to say, when you attack science, face it, evolution is a proven fact. See how they ha they've, they've mixed science and evolution as if they were the same thing? Science, real science, is knowledge derived from the study of existing evidence, things that are testable, studyable, repeatable, observable. Real science, uh, evolution is a belief on how we came about. See, they're not the same thing. Creation and evolution are the same thing. They're both beliefs in how we came about. But today, secularists own the system, and they teach kids that their religious belief in how we came about evolution is science when it's not science. Real science, a believer's best friend, is knowledge derived from the study of existing evidence. Did you know that over 80% of the 200 or so branches of modern science were started by Christians to study God's creation? Did you know that? There wouldn't even be science without Christianity. You see, we thought, well, we have this intelligent creator. He probably put some laws and principles in place to govern his creation. And if we study God's creation, we can discover some of those laws and principles and put them to use in our lives. Uh, real science has led to lots of great improvements from penicillin to, to laptops, projectors, and space shuttles. Real science. Um, Unfortunately, over the last 150 years, real science has been undermined by secularism, and now they teach their belief in place of real science, undermining both scientific research and scientific education in the process, along with the lives of billions of people for eternity. You know, the Bible is the only book in the history of the world that lives on its ability to correctly predict the future. You know, most all religious texts make prophecies, uh, and maybe one out of ten come through and nine out of ten don't. The Bible is 100%. They've had hundreds of prophecies made that have already come true. The handful left are shaping up right before our very eyes. The Bible even says the way you tell uh, a false religion from the Word of God is their prophecies won't come true. One of the great prophecies given to the uh, ancient Israelites found in the book of Jeremiah was that people would turn their back on God, saying to a stone, Thou hast brought me forth. Well, that was 3,000 years ago. I mean, you know, today, we, we're way too smart to let anyone tell us we came from a stone, right? I mean, none of you would let anyone tell you you came from a stone. You would object, right? Because we're so smart, right? Well, let's go to the modern textbook and see what's being taught. Kids, Earth is thought, believed, to have formed four and a half billion years ago, and it started out as a big ball of hot rock. And then oceans formed as it rained on the stone for millions of years of time. They are teaching we came from a stone. You know, I have atheists come up to me uh, 
quite often, and they'll get right in my face, and they'll say, oh, you believe your invisible God created the world. I always look them right back in the eye and say, you think we came from a wet rock. <laughs> you should try it. It takes the wind right out of their sails. And what they will do, they will stutter backwards and regroup and say, well, uh, we, we don't believe that. You're making fun of our position. And I'll say, well, I'm not making fun of your position. I just want to make sure you actually understand what you claim to believe. You believe in the Big Bang, right? They'll say yes. Don't get into which one. I think we're on our fourth version. And they'll say, yeah. So you believe next to nothing blew up, right? Yeah. And then after billions of years, a big rock formed, right? Yeah. And it rained on the rock for millions of years, right? Yeah. So you're sitting there with this wet, sterile rock that has no life on it whatsoever. Where do you think we came from? And they'll say, uh, wow, I, I do believe we came from a wet rock. And what you've just done is you have just prepared the soil now to plant the seed. Because they have just realized they've been duped into believing this false religious belief that's totally ridiculous and anti-science, scientific as well. You know, no wonder in Colossians 2 we're told to beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Beware of man's philosophies. Because there really are only two viable philosophies out there. Either the world evolved all on its own, like our secular uh, textbooks and colleges teach, or God created the world just like he says he did. Those are your only two viable options. Well, I live near Sedona. We do have that group that says, well, maybe we're not here at all. Maybe we just think we're here. But <laughs> as a general rule, I don't worry a lot about this group because we really are here. You know, the Bible tells us prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Did you know the Bible tells us to prove all things? Sometimes people say, you're not supposed to prove the Bible. Well, that's not what the Bible says. You see, God's given us lots of evidence his word is true. And so if we have any doubt at all, or we can help somebody else that has doubt, he wants us to prove things. His, and real science you can use to, to show that God's word is authoritative and reliable. So I want to look quickly at the top ten lies of Darwinian evolutionism. We're going to look at life coming from non-life, the supposed simple cell, what's called neo-Darwinism, which is actually taught in schools now, has been for quite a while. The difference between micro and macro evolution, we talked about that briefly this morning. Homology, the study of similarities. Uh, resistance to poisons and antibiotics. Uh, the theory of recapitulation. I'll explain these things when we get there, if you haven't heard of them before. The fossil record. Uh, Tetalic Rosea, one of the, the uh, heroes of evolution today. And hominids like Lucy, another one of the messiahs of Darwinian evolution today. Let's take a look at these. Uh, lie number one, life came from non-life. So they've got the big wet rock, and it's rained on the rock now for millions of years. So they got this big wet rock, but there's no life on it whatsoever. So in all honesty to Darwinists, they will claim that Darwinian evolution has nothing to do with, this, with the start of life. They would love to be able to show you how life started without God. The problem is it's a scientific impossibility. They can't. So the origin of species actually has nothing to do with the origin of the species. Okay? So they will claim that, that it has nothing to do with the start of life because they can't get life to start from non-life. It's a scientific impossibility. Darwin tried to claim that life started in a little warm pond. Then they came up with spontaneous generation that poof, life just starts on its own. That was proven totally scientifically unacceptable years ago. So now they teach a biogenesis, which is basically spontaneous generation stretched out over time. Still, they say chemicals slowly came together and came to life. You still had to have that poof moment where non-life came to life. And spontaneous generation is a scientific impossibility. Now, in real science, a Christian's best friend, they have the law of biogenesis. The law of biogenesis holds that life only comes from life. Living matter can only produce life. Non-living non matter, like a wet, sterile rock, cannot produce life. It's a scientific impossibility. So they're going to try to get kids to believe that scientists in labs have gotten life to come from non-living matter. Never have scientists, even in labs, gotten non-life to produce living matter. 
they, they refer back to this Miller-Urey experiment and thousands of copycats ever since. And what they were able to achieve with a well-designed system was, was an apparatus that would produce some amino acids, which, by the way, are non-living chemical compounds. They produced non-life, non-living amino acids. But what they claimed was they had somehow produced life in the lab. They try to get kids to believe they've produced life in the lab. They've never come close to producing life in a lab. Amino acids come in right and left-handed versions. They have to be all left-handed for life. And they have uh, nucleotide sugars. All the left-handed amino acids have to have right-handed nucleotide sugars. There's no mathematical possibility of this happening on its own. They've never come close to producing life in the labs. They try to get kids to think that they have. But think about it logically. The world's brightest scientists, building on years and years of millions of other scientists' research, with lab equipment and billions of dollars of computers and salaries thrown in, cannot make non-living matter produce life. Yet we're supposed to believe rocks and seawater did it on their own? Oh, but not today when they could show it happening so you could test, study, and observe it. No, it, it was so long ago and, and far away. That is not science. That is false science, and it's full millions and billions of people. So I've spoken at NAU several times over the years, and they finally um, they started an accredited class attacking me in biblical creation. And for that class, they um, used a book by this famous atheist, that's her bias. So, you know, everyone's got a bias, by the way. Everybody has a bias. And it's going to determine how they interpret evidence. Well, she's also the president of the National Center of Science Education. So I thought, well, let's go to the new college book used to attack biblical creation. And let's see how the president of the National Center of Science Education explains how life came about on its own. And on page 26, here is her explanation to get over the law of biogenesis. And it says, the origin of life was a continuum of events with a lot of iffy stuff in the middle. <laughs> and if you think I'm making it up, you can Google it. It's on page 26 of the book. That is the modern college explanation of how life started without God. Do you think maybe Darwinism is not a scientific issue, but it's a religious issue? Yeah. Absolutely. It's a religious belief on how we came about. In fact, this former uh, Harvard professor and Nobel Prize winner said, modern biologists having reviewed the downfall of spontaneous generation, that's poof, life started on its own, yet unwilling to accept creation, are left with nothing. They've got no way to get life started without God. They're left with nothing. Well, they do have the iffy stuff. Darwinian lie number two. Look, life started on its own, but it wasn't anything complex. It was just, it was just a simple little cell. You've heard of the, the, the simple cell, right? Well, this textbook tells kids, kids, all the many forms of life on Earth today are descended, stated as a scientific fact, are descended from a common ancestor found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. How in the world is a kid supposed to argue with that? It had just been told this is a scientific fact. Well, since science is knowledge derived from the state of evidence, what evidence do they have of this? Well, it says right here, it says, no traces of those events remain. There is not a shred of evidence, and they're, they're teaching children that this is a scientifically proven fact. I thought real science was knowledge derived from the study of evidence. Again, we're not talking science when we're talking Darwinism. We're talking a religious belief on how we came about. You know, since they say, well, maybe life started out as a, just a simple little bacteria cell, let's just take a brief look at a bacteria cell. They're run by tiny molecular motors called bacterial flagellum. These tiny molecular motors are made up of about 40 very specific and complex proteins that must be in an exact order to form all the various parts of this molecular motor. This molecular motor allows the cell to swim around and perform its functions. It can even change gears depending on how much weight it's towing or pushing. So the problems with this coming about on its own are many. One thing, all those parts had to be in the exact order to form the flagellum or it never would have formed. It had to be whole and complete from the start. And to make matters worse for Darwinists, 
The process of putting the flagellum together requires other molecular motors that also had to be whole and complete at the very start of life. This is the reason we can't get life to start from non-life. There is no way that this could happen simultaneously upon its, its own. You know, genetic information is a huge problem for Darwinism. You know, in real science, in engineering, we don't see complex uh, information coming about on its own. Information, intelligent information, has to come from an intelligent source in real science. That is, real science, a believer's best friend. Genetic information, we now know, can read the best, okay, let me back up. The best human technology reads in one direction. We now know genetic information can be read forwards or backwards. And they're starting to think it can be read diagonally. Try to write a one-page paper that makes sense that can be read forwards, backwards, and diagonally. <laughs> the complexity here is beyond human comprehension. One mathematician molecular biologist calculated the odds of just one DNA chromosome arranging itself in nature to be one in 10 to the 100 billionth power. Well, what kind of a number is that? Well, one in 10 to the 50th power is considered absolute zero. One in 10 to the 100 billionth power. It would be like you playing the Arizona lottery. I'm not saying that you should. I'm saying the odds would be as if you played the Arizona lottery, it'd be like your odds of winning the lottery every week, 52 weeks a year, for 27,000 years in a row. That's the mathematical possibilities of one chromosome coming together on its own. Darwinists need trillions, not one. Think about the complexity here. We are each made up of an estimated 75 trillion cells. You know, honestly, that's a number beyond our comprehension. Just to get a, a grasp for numbers, follow me on this. Let's, let's use seconds, like 60 seconds in a minute. Let's just use seconds. A million seconds ago would have been 11 days ago. About a week ago last Thursday. That would have been a million seconds. What's the difference between a million and a billion? Well, if a million seconds ago was 11 days ago, a billion seconds ago would have been about 1988. It's a big difference between a million and a billion. Well, what's the difference between a billion and a trillion? Well, if a billion seconds ago was 30 years ago, a trillion seconds would have been 30,000 years of time. There's a big difference between a million and a billion and a trillion. And we're made up of an estimated 75 trillion cells. Think about this. The genetic information, a single cell's DNA contains three billion base pairs of genetic information per cell times trillions of cells. Wow, this is complexity that's literally beyond human comprehension. You know, they had this SETI program for years, 40 years, spent billions, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And they had these listening devices aimed at outer space all around the world. And if they would have just come up with a, with a dot, 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 they would have claimed that proved intelligent life forms elsewhere. Yet they look at this inside of a cell and they say it has nothing to do with intelligence. That's religious bias masquerading as science. That is not real science. Well, think about the complexity with this. You know, the, the smaller as we shrink things down, like cameras and things, the more expensive they become, and it, it takes a lot of technology, really advanced technology, to shrink some of these things down. Think about the complexity here of our DNA. These, these trillions and trillions times billions and billions of genetic uh, information inside of a cell is so compactly designed and stored that the genetic information to code all seven billion people on Earth could fit into the, a container the size of an aspirin. Talk about complexity, right? Okay, so I think we can assume this didn't evolve from a wet rock on its own, okay? I think it's fair to say. Darwinian lie number three is neo-Darwinism. This is what is actually taught, that mutations create new and beneficial genetic information, and mutations make things Darwinian macro evolve. They've got a lot of uh, different types of mutations they threw out there, like copying or duplication mutations, point mutations, Hox gene mutations, and frame shift mutations. 
I cover these in my book, The Cost, in nice, easy, uh, one or two paragraph examples to understand. But just for time, we're just going to look at a frame shift mutation. They come in deletions, insertions, and inversions. But just to give you an idea of, of the hocus pocus they use here, to claim that these make things better and give new information that propel Darwinian style evolution. I'm going to use uh, these three simple sentences. The day was hot, the hot day had one sun, the sun was hot, the one day. Now, we're going to look at a deletion frame shift mutation. Let's say the first letter was deleted. Well, all of the information would then shift to the left. And this is what you end up with. Now, technically, technically, that's 17 new words. You see, if you want to get in a debate with a Darwinist and you claim they do not have a way to add new information, you will lose the debate. There's new information, technically. If you claim they don't have a way to get new and beneficial genetic information, you will win the debate. So this is the hocus pocus that they use. Because technically, okay, that's 17 new words, but they're completely non-functional. They've lost 17 functional words and all the meaning of the genetic data. That's what mutations do. They don't power Darwinian change. Mutations result in the sorting or the loss of the functional genetic information. It's called gene depletion. Mutations produce weaker and weaker gene pools. Darwinian line number four, that microevolution is macroevolution. Micro is, we talked about it this morning, but I'll, I'll cover it again quickly. Micro is just changes within the same kind, like dogs producing dogs, pine trees producing pine trees. And you can have slight changes within the dogs, but dogs are still only going to produce dogs. You can breed roses to get red, yellow, white roses. Some do better in, in Flagstaff, some do better in Casa Grande. Uh, but they're still roses. Roses will only produce roses. These are micro changes. You could call it microevolution, microadaptations, etc. They are micro changes, not Darwinian, macro changes, which would be a dog producing a non dog. It's just simply kinds bring forth after their kind. And as I pointed out this morning, that's vital, especially for kids in high school and college to understand, because 10 times in the book of Genesis, we're told plants or animals will bring forth after their kind. And after millions of scientific observations, the only thing that is ever seen, and it's seen every single time, is kinds only bring forth after their kind, like we were told 10 times in the book of Genesis. Microadaptations, like mutations, are also caused by the sorting or loss of the starting genetic information. So gene pools get weaker and weaker. It's called gene depletion. Well, students are given lots of examples of biblically correct microadaptations, but then they switch the discussion and lead the kids to think that those micro changes are proof for Darwinian macroevolution. It's the old bait and switch con game. Show biblically correct micro and tell kids this proves macro and refutes what the Bible says. Talk about bait and switch, right? You know, they, they focus on biblically correct micro changes because. There is no evidence of Darwinian macroevolution to show anybody. Never has been. Never will be. It doesn't happen. In fact, Darwin, when he was on the Galapagos Islands, made a brilliant observation. He counted 13 variety, varieties of finches. Brown, black finches. Some had thick bills. Some had thin bills. Great observation. Kinds bringing forth after their kind. Per, uh, finches producing finches. Biblically correct. Micro change. But then he jumped to the miraculous, erroneous conclusion that somehow, given enough time, the magic ingredient, those changes would lead them to being non-finches macroevolution. Never has anyone seen macro change, including Charles Darwin. So this is how I show people how to destroy Darwinism in four seconds flat. Start your watch. Gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility. Stop your watch. That's the reason they have no evidence. It's a scientific impossibility. It never happened. So I can speak on college campuses, and I can say it loud and clear. There is no evidence, and the professors know there is any. They know it. They, they would send their kids to try to throw things out at me because they couldn't stand up and produce one. They knew I would just say, give us one example. We don't have to debate this. Just give me one example. Prove me wrong. 
And if you know what the frauds are, they've got nothing. Gene depletion plus natural selection is what real science observes, and that makes Darwinism, which needs the massive amounts of new and beneficial genetic information, a scientific impossibility. It never happened. Uh, why number five? I'm going to divide this into part A and B, but homology. Homology is the study of similarities. So every time they see a, simil a similarity, they claim this is proof of Darwinism. Um, we're going to look at similar biochemistry first. I mentioned this today, but we're told that chimpanzees are 98% the same in their genes as, as humans, but real science has as much a 30% difference, and real science is getting a wider and wider difference all the time, so why do they continue to claim 98% the same similarities? That's just a fraud to begin with. But as I said this morning, I gave away one of my better jokes this morning, sorry about that, but 75% of a worms uh, in a human's biochemistry is the same. They don't teach we evolve from worms. Your biochemistry is 50% the same as that from a banana. They don't teach we came from bananas, do they? Why? Because everybody would see what a fraud it is if they did. You know, so let's go to lie number six, antibiotic or poison resistance. You know, they claim this is actually one of the big proofs of Darwinism today. They'll say uh, uh, bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotics or, or cockroaches becoming resistant to poison is proof they're evolving bigger and better. Well, first of all, this has absolutely nothing to do with Darwinian macro change. It would just be bacteria producing bacteria or cockroaches producing cockroaches. But actually, this isn't even micro change. Uh, first of all, let's say I had 1,000 cockroaches right here on the, on the floor and they were running right toward these two nice people in the front row. <laughs> Thousand cockroaches. <laughs> but I sprayed them with insecticide and it killed 998 of them, but two survived. Did those two instantaneously evolve an immune system? No, of course not. They already had the gene in their gene pool that allowed them to survive that particular poison. The other 998 didn't have that gene or it was turned off at the time and it killed the 998. But the two that survived, when they have offspring, the offspring inherit that gene that makes them immune to the poison. They evolved nothing. So why do Darwinists use this as one of their big proofs of Darwinian change? Because they've got no real evidence. It never happened. Gene depletion plus natural selection makes it a scientific impossibility. Lie number seven is in, comes from uh, the study of embryology. And the lie is that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. You'd never fall for that, would you? <laughs> so how's a kid supposed to argue with that? Basically what that means is they're teaching you go through your evolutionary stages while you're in your mother's womb. This was invented about 10 years after Darwin's book came out by Ernst Haeckel. What Haeckel did was he loved Darwin's theory but he had the same problem Darwinists have today. He couldn't find any evidence that ever happened. So he did what Darwinists have become famous for. He invented some evidence. And he came up with the biogenetic law, the theory of recapitulation. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, that you go through your evolutionary stages in your mother's womb. Now those are his drawings from left to right across the top. But if you look at the, uh, the photos right below, they don't look like his drawings. And what was proven in the 1870s is that he had taken a human in the embryonic stage, made a drawing of the human, and then made copies of the human and label them fish, turtles, salamanders, etc. And thus was born the theory of recapitulation that you go through your evolutionary stages in your mother's womb. Proven fraud in the 1870s and still taught in colleges today. Let me ask you a question. Why don't they just get rid of all the frauds and bring out the millions of examples of Darwinian macro change? They don't have any. They've never had any. It never happened. It's a scientific impossibility. Here's an NAU textbook. They pick on me, so I figured I'd use their textbooks. But honestly, there's nothing different between NAU and ASU or any other colleges and or high schools in the biology textbooks. Uh, and I should mention, if you uh, look at, uh, at biology, if you look at a uh, biology course that's t taught in a biblical-oriented school and compare that to biology from a secular school, they'd be 98% the same. 
There's not that much difference. The only difference is, did these things, do micro-adaptations only bring forth after their kind, or do they bring forth other kinds? And does life start on its own, or did it take God to start life? That's really just about the only difference. I mean, real science is real science. Photosynthesis is photosynthesis. Cell division is cell division. So it's, not any, it's really not an attack on science. There's not that much science involved. It's the religious belief of Darwinism mixed in with science is the issue. But this NAU textbook tells kids, kids, whether they develop into fish, amphibians, or humans, all vertebrate embryos start out very similar with gill slits and a long tail. You used to have gill slits and a long tail? Really? And then it goes on and asks the kids, well, why would human embryos have gill slits and a long tail unless their ancestors had them? And kids, by the millions, lose their faith in God. There's just one problem here. You never had a long tail, even as an embryo. You never had gill slits. Those are not slits in the skin. Those are folds in the skin that later develop into organs in your throat and neck area. You never had gill slits, and you never had a long tail. So there's a, lot, a little problem there with what they're telling kids and misleading them in the process. Darwinian lie number eight, the fossil record. They claim the fossil record is on their side. That is all bluff and bluster. The fossil record is a total embarrassment to the fairy tale of Darwinian evolution. In fact, <clears throat> this textbook shows what they call an evolutionary tree of life. And at the base, someone typed in the word invertebrate ancestor. Well, why don't they show what it was? <laughs> they wouldn't have any idea what it was. I don't know why they just make something up. That's what they usually do. But then someone took a nice box of crayons, and they drew nice colorful lines connecting the word invertebrate ancestor to everything in the world. And they claim, there's your proof. Everything evolved from the invertebrate ancestor. If you look at it closely, do you actually see any proof? Wouldn't you assume as a student that each one of those colorful lines is backed up by hundreds and hundreds of transitional fossils as one kind slowly evolved into the other? That would be the assumption, right? But as of today, they don't have a viable missing link that will stand up to true scientific scrutiny. They only have a handful to even try to run up the flagpole out there. And taking a box of crayons and drawing lines connecting things to each other doesn't prove a thing. It'd be like me taking an orange crayon and drawing a line from the podium to Pastor Jerry and saying that proves he, he came from the podium. Makes no sense whatsoever. Oh, wait a minute. This, uh, this, this book tells kids Archaeopteryx is the missing link between reptiles and birds. Now, this was found two years after Darwin's book came out in 1861. And it was found in a layer, and they said, well, uh, Archaeopteryx was the size of a pigeon and had claws on its wings, proving it's a reptile becoming a bird. Well, the uh, Hoitzen is found in South America alive today. It's about the size of a pigeon and has claws on its wing. No one's claiming it's a missing link because you could actually test, study, and observe it, see? And actually, they had given up on Archaeopteryx 20 years ago when... Scientists found in the geologic column, those stratified layers, they found modern bird fossils in the layer below the layer Archaeopteryx had been in, which from their standpoint would put the modern bird before their missing link. So it doesn't make any sense. And more importantly, reptile DNA doesn't have genetic information to form feathers, which are very complex structures. And real science, a believer's best friend, knows of no way for nature to add that kind of genetic information to a gene pool. So they claim that uh, the uh, low fin fish is a missing link between amphibians and fish. And the story goes, a low fin went extinct 325 million years ago, so you can't test and study it, so you just have to believe us here. But he got bored one day, he couldn't swim, so he walked around the bottom of the ocean on his low fins, and I guess he got bored one day and climbed out on land and became an amphibian. Well, that's a nice story, but amphibians have feet, shoulders, elbows, claws, a muscular system, and a central nervous system, and more that fish do not have. And real science knows of no way for nature to add that kind of information to a gene pool. Worse, the low fin fish has been found alive today, not extinct 325 million years, and it doesn't walk around on the bottom of the ocean floor. He's a very good swimmer. 
And the fossilized version that we're told is up to 300 million years old looks exactly like the living fish. Well, I thought things evolved over millions of years of time, right? So all those sedimentary layers laid down by water were laid down in the global flood. We'll talk about that in the second uh, session tonight. But they have lost this. And hang on to this because we're going to get into one of their, their big missing links here in a minute. But in case you think it's just me claiming they've got no evidence, they actually have a key theory that explains why they've got no evidence. It's called punctuated equilibrium. If you stood up in a college course and said, well, professor, why is there no evidence in the fossil record? They're going to say, punctuated equilibrium. Don't you know anything? And basically what this means is evolution didn't happen over a steady, long period of time. No, no, there, there was a spurt of evolution and then a long period with no change. They call it stasis. And then a spurt of evolution and a long period with no change. And because of that, no evidence was captured in the fossil record They've got no evidence. It's not because of punctuated equilibrium, by the way. It's because it never happened. But they actually admit there's no evidence, and they've got a theory to explain it. But I thought science was knowledge derived from the study of the evidence. Darwinian evolution is a religious belief. It's not science. So lie number nine. Tetalic rosea is now one of the messiahs of Darwinian evolution. So follow me on the deceit here. It's really amazing. This was introduced appropriately on April Fool's Day, 2006. And the New York Times that day wrote, think about what they say here. It's still a fish, but exhibiting changes that anticipate the beginnings of wrists, elbows, and shoulders. Wait a minute. It doesn't show the beginning of wrists, elbows, and shoulders. It shows changes that anticipate the beginning. How do you anticipate random chance beginnings that are going to change this nubby little bone in its side into elbows, wrists, and the central nervous system and the muscular systems that would take? See, they've got this little nubby bone in the side, and that's what they're talking about, anticipating these changes. Okay, think about this logically. Tetalic, and we just talked about the fossilized lobefin fish that was supposed to have been extinct 325 million years, found alive today. So think about this. Tetalic and the fossilized lobefin fish both have that little nubby bone in their side. And the fossilized fish has now been found alive today. It still has that nubby bone. It hasn't changed at all. So why would they assume tetalics changed into elbows, wrists, and shoulders? There's other fish as well that have these nubby little bones today, like some catfish. None of them show any evolutionary change. Why would we suspect or even think tetalic would have developed elbows, wrists, shoulders, the central nervous system, the muscular system, etc. And this is one of their big proofs of Darwinism today. That brings us back to number five. On a 5B, homology, the study of similarity, is a similar bone structure. So they show these nice drawings of a, the, the forearm of a, of a foreleg of a lizard, the foreleg of a horse, the flipper of a whale, the forearm of a human, and they say, look, all vertebrates are have two bones in the forelimb structure, proving we've all evolved from a common ancestor. Well, what would be the common ancestor this modern college textbook is teaching kids we evolved from? Believe it or not, they teach we're evolving from the lobe fin fish, which is found fossilized and living with no change whatsoever. And kids by the millions are losing their faith See, I can stand here and make this look really stupid, and it is. Really deceitful, and it is. But very few kids ever see this information. They only see that we evolved from a lobe fin fish, which shows no change at all in the fossil record. My friends, any argument, especially kids in high school, college, etc., any argument claiming similarities, biochemistry or bone structure, prove evolution, is a much, much better argument that you have the same designer. You have similarities because we have the same biblical creator. I drive a Ford pickup truck and my next door neighbor has a Ford van. Their dashboards are identical. It's not because they evolved from a moped. <laughs> it's, it's because they have the same designer, right? Any argument of similarities is, and kids, please remember that because the biggest proof they're going to hit you with, besides Tetalic and Lucy, are similarities. 
Remember, similarities are proof of the same designer. And that brings us to lie number 10, the hominids, the supposed closest link between ape and man. And this textbook shows humans connected to everything on Earth, including jellyfish and worms, by a nice red line. What more for proof could you want than a nice red line, right? I mean, how about some fossil evidence? Let's look at a couple of the, of the major and most famous supposed hominids. Uh, the first major hominid was uh, supposedly discovered about 1912, and it's called uh, the Great Piltdown Man. Now, this actually misled not millions, billions of people into rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It was the Messiah of evolution from about 1910 until the mid-1950s. It fooled so many people. We finally kicked creation and prayer out of our schools and started teaching our kids they evolved without God. And then in the mid-1950s, it was proven these jokers had taken the skull cap of a human, the jawbone from an orangutan, filed them down so they fit together, acid-treated both sides, buried them in a, in a rock quarry in Piltdown, England, waited two years and came along and discovered Piltdown Man and spent the rest of their lives as world-renowned Darwinists speaking on any college campus they wanted on a total and complete fraud. Nebraska Man was used as proof for Darwinism. All that was found in Nebraska Man was a piece of a broken tooth. But, but Darwinists are pretty creative. They, from that broken tooth, they re constructed Nebraska man, his family, even the tools they would have worked it with from a piece of a broken tooth. It was later proven that broken tooth came from an extinct pig. Yeah, there's the real Nebraska man right there. So Lucy's been the Messiah along with Tetalix. This was discovered back about 1974, and... Um, the, the founder became the uh, head of the origins department at ASU. So he made his whole living off of this monkey bone here, ape bone, if you want to be official. But uh, this was what was found, about a third of a skeleton. It would have stood, oh, about three and a half feet tall, drug its knuckles on the ground. But they said, we know it's an ape becoming human because the thigh bone, the femur, angles to the knee. And humans have angle thigh bones. They forgot to mention almost all tree-dwelling apes have angle femurs. Hmm. They said, but the knee, the knee was, think about this, slightly bigger than a normal ape's knee, proving it's becoming human. Well, if you took knee joint of everybody in this room, they'd be different sizes. That doesn't prove anything. Oh, and also the knee in question, they forgot to mention, was found over a mile away and 210 feet deeper in the strata layer. Yeah, if that was Lucy's knee, I want to see the airplane that hit that monkey. Must have been going about 700 miles an hour right through the treetops, boy. Anyways, they found other such skeleton scents. They're called Australopithecus, uh, Australopithecus afarensis. And they have curved toes and fingers so they can hang on to tree limbs. I was speaking at a college, and there in the Q&A, this one gal stood up. She said, well, my, my uh, paleontology professor tells us that apes left the trees and moved out into the grass plains. And they couldn't see over the grass, so they grew taller and became humans. Oh, gee, that makes sense. Um, but I'm like, well, wait a minute. If they went out on the grass and they couldn't see over the grass, wouldn't the hyenas and the lions have eaten them? <laughs> That's the reason they were living in the trees, right? Anyways, so this is Lucy. Think about this from 1987. Anatomists have concluded these are not a link between ape and man and did not walk upright like a human. Yet here's a new textbook showing Lucy walking upright like a human while talking on a cell phone. <laughs> what are the odds? Now think about it logically with millions of various apes and monkeys having lived and died over the last 500 years alone. Why, why does finding a monkey bone prove Darwinian evolution? Doesn't it just prove that when monkeys die, they leave their bones behind? Absolutely. And those are the top 10 lies of Darwinian evolution, crushed in about 45 minutes. It doesn't take a lot, but it takes an opportunity to show somebody the facts. And quite frankly, those are their biggest proofs. When I say they've got nothing, what I actually mean is they've got nothing. 
See, gene depletion and natural selection make it impossible. Here's an email I got, though. I'm a college-educated Christian and firm believer that creation is nonsense. God used either progressive creation or theistic evolution to make us. It has become such a divisive issue in the church that this information gets blocked from our Christian children and grandchildren. And we need to stop making it divisive and really just go back to the key question has to be, what does the Word of God say? Let's go back and see what the Word of God says. And then let us show some information that supports God's Word. Real science is a believer's best friend. Guys like this have, have gone through college or even a compromising seminary, and they've been taught that creation is nonsense. That's what they're being taught by atheists and even some people that should be on our side. We need to help each other. Iron sharpens iron, right? You cannot sharpen iron. Iron can't sharpen iron if the iron doesn't want to be sharpened. We, we all need help. We need to help each other, right? And that's, we need to stand on the truth, and we always have to start out with the authority of God's word. And the Bible tells us to avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. Not real science. Real science is your best friend. But watch out for false science. Darwinian or secular philosophies masquerading as science, which some professing have erred concerning their faith. The calling of our ministry, again, to teach about creation, evolution, age of the issues, and provide reasons for the hope that's in the heart of all true believers and all true seekers. In our next session, we'll talk about age of the earth. I'll cover Pangaea, continental drift, coal formation, radiometric dating, carbon dating. We're going to go through the top ten lies of death before Adam beliefs. And we'll do the same thing to that. And I'll show you proof of the flood. It's really a no-brainer. Now, we've got all these in our DVDs and such. I'll talk about that later. We actually ran out of books. That was my own fault. Um, I was supposed to order some a week ago, and I ordered them like three days ago. And for some reason, they didn't make it there in time. So what we're doing is if you want to get the book, The Cost, and it, it's a really good book for these issues. It makes it easy to understand. Uh, the, the youth in the back helping us, they're, they're taking payments for it and writing down your name and address. And we're going to ship it all this week to the church office. So please don't get it because it's not back there. It's, uh, one gal gave it to her mother uh, a year ago at Christmas time. Her mother was a retired biochemist and non-believer. And her mother read the book a year ago and told her daughter, I didn't know information like this even existed. And she's since accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So the information is there. Um, just because of my mess up, don't, don't fail to, to get something that might help you or somebody else. Our Grand Canyon rim and raft trips. Um, um, please talk to Pastor. We're going to talk about trying to set one up for the church. But I take church groups and all on our rim trips, and we do rim and raft trips as well. So my book, The Cost, is back there. covers the top ten Old Earth beliefs. Excuse me, you can order it back there. It's not back there. And um, top 10 Darwinian beliefs, top 10 proofs of creation, top 10 proofs of the global flood, and references over 200 Bible verses. Because really and truly, what's this all about? Well, it's got to be about tying it into the Word of God, right? Otherwise, what's the point? And that's really what the point is. God's Word is true, word for word and cover to cover. And that's the story of the gal who is the biochemist right there, by the way. And our coloring books, too, of which I also ran out of the dinosaur books. Let me end this first session with this. Let's be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness where they lie in wait to deceive. Watch out for man's philosophies. Let me end this first session with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I hope and pray the information that we've shared will be eye-opening and a blessing to many and give us information we can share with other people to help clear some of the stumbling blocks and lead us to putting our total and complete faith in your word, your word who became flesh and dwelt among us, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his great name I do pray. Amen.